All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to our author talk with, with Rick Rockland, author of the recent book, A History of the Nets. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone to hold your questions until the end of the presentation. We will have a Q&A after the interview, and you can type your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A box. I'll be looking at both, and I'll read those out loud after the interview. I would like to introduce our author, Rick Rockland. Rick has been front and center in the New York sports scene, covering the Brooklyn Nets, New York Jets, New York Mets, and New York Giants as a beat reporter over the past decade. Lachlan's work has been featured online via Fox Sports and CBS Sports, along with broadcast appearances at various channels. Lachlan currently operates an independent Brooklyn Nets blog at netsinsider.com. He currently serves as an adjunct professor of marketing at his alma mater, Harley Dickinson University. In his free time, Rick can be found playing and watching the sport he loves most, basketball. Our interviewer, David German, has been a fan of the Nets since their inception in 1967 and has attended at least one game in all but one of their seasons in New Jersey and Brooklyn. In addition, he has traveled to attend Nets road games in Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, Detroit, Miami, Los Angeles, and Sacramento. A special highlight for him was being in attendance when the Nets defeated the San Antonio Spurs in game four of the 2003 NBA Finals. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to David. Well, thank you, Chelsea. And I want to say thank you to you and the staff at North Bergen Public Library for allowing us to do this event. We're truly appreciative. So thank you. So I want to first start off with uh, Rick asking you just the first question is, you know, Tell us why you wrote this book. As far as I know, there's only been one book written about the history of the Nets. It came out by a gentleman named Guy Kipp in 2003. And then now, just recently, your book has appeared. David, let me lead off by saying thank you very much to you and both Chelsea and the library for hosting the event. Uh, I appreciate this. And it kind of ties in with my inspiration for the book. You know, I grew up watching the Nets, of course, at the Meadowlands. I go back to the early 90s is, you know, when I was growing up and I would always look up into the rafters and I would see what looked like the Stars and Stripe jersey, which are actually debuting and, and re reimagining this year for this current team. And I would always wonder and I'd see uh, Bill Melchioni and Julius Irving, of course, you hear about Dr. J and their strong ties to the organization, of course, being a Hall of Fame player, playing with the Philadelphia 76ers in the NBA. But I never truly understood, and I, and I felt as a fan that it was my mission to understand what the connection between the Nets that were in New Jersey, the Long Island Nets, which of course were the New York Nets when they played in Long Island, and then even going back prior to that as New Jersey Americans. And there's been so many iterations. That's the theme of the book is they've been so nomadic. They're never in one place for too long of a period of time. So my inspiration really was I felt growing up that I always had a curiosity about history and sports and different topics. And I feel like the team really didn't honor the history, didn't talk about the history much. And for the new age fans, let's say fans that are even 25 years or younger, probably don't even remember the New York Nets, maybe not even remember the New Jersey Nets. So I felt kind of responsibility to kind of carry that torch and to tell the story of the, of the Nets is because as you mentioned, David, it feels like it's kind of something that's been overlooked and I felt as though the organization kind of shunned their history because let's face it, there were a lot more laughable, bad moments than there were positive and triumphant moments. But nonetheless, it's, it's a story that hopefully will be interesting if everybody, for everybody to read if you haven't already. So let's go back to the beginning. And a lot of people don't know this, but they were not the Nets their first year of their existence. They came into existence in 1967 and they were the New Jersey Americans. Can you tell us a little about the New Jersey Americans who were only the New Jersey Americans for one year? And admittedly, as I, you know, full disclosure, I, I went back to the early 90s when watching the team. So I leaned heavily on interviews from Herb Turetsky, who was the official scorekeeper for the Nets for 54 years. He set a Guinness Book of World Records, 2,200 games that he kept the score for. And I leaned heavily on Larry Brown, who ultimately coached the Nets in the early 1980s. Of course, had a storied uh, coaching career. He, he played against them in the ABA. So as you mentioned, it's funny because New Jersey Americans, Arthur Brown, who was the first owner, he wanted the team to have New York and to be the New York Americans. And at every turn, they tried to play the Manhattan 
uh, armory, they were turned away because the Knicks had a stranglehold on every venue within New York, the confines of New York City and really even New York State. Um, so basically, Arthur Brown and his designees were scrambling to try to find any venues, a venue that was suitable for the team to play. And just in a long about roundabout way, they, they wound up at the Teaneck Armory, uh, of course, in Teaneck, New Jersey, uh, which, which amounted to a pit stop for the team. Of course, they only spent that 1967 into 68 season, one full season. Um, and then they had a name change the following season. It was a really chaotic year. Uh, they had Max says uh, Max Zavlosky as their f- first head coach, and it's funny because Herb Turetsky, how he even became the scorekeeper for that game was he was going to see a childhood friend of his, Tony Jackson, who was playing for the Nets. They were from the same neighborhood in Brooklyn and Brownsville, and he had known Max, the head coach of the Nets, from his AAU team that Arthur Brown had uh, owned and managed the a- the a- AAU Freighters, the New York Freighters which actually was supposed to be the new the team's name, the New York Freighters. But anyway, so he had kept the score for that AAU team. And as a favor to Max Zavlosky, he said, I'll keep score for that game. And he sat down at that scorer's table and, 54, and he was there for 54 years. It's, it's a remarkable story. And when you look at, I entitled the chapter, Humble Beginnings, because you had a scorekeeper that basically just by happenstance happened to be there and was there for 54 years. You had a... Of the referees, one was a roller derby referee that Larry Brown told me an interesting story about how he was one of the captains and he went for the, you know, at the mid circle for the tip off. And what, he heard that one of the referees was a roller derby referee and the other didn't even have a proper uniform. He had an IZOD shirt on. So you look at where this team is in this franchise right now. I know there's been a lot of turmoil this offseason with the Brooklyn Nets, trade demands and all the, the hoopla that's gone on. But just imagine how that started in such a small, humble, basically glorified high school gym in Teaneck, New Jersey, the Teaneck Armory, and how it's evolved into a billion dollar asset team brand right now. It's truly remarkable. So, you know, that first season at the Teaneck Armory was unlike any other. And it ended in the most bizarre fashion ever that they finished the regular season tied with the Kentucky Colonels, uh, you know, for the what would amount to a playing game that they were going to host. And their venue is double booked. So they, Arthur Brown, again, is scrambling, trying to find a venue. Where, where can we host this game? And so he looks to Comac Arena, which otherwise, which was also known as Long Island Arena, to host the game. And they, when they arrive, both teams arrive, the Colonels and the Nets, it's an unplayable condition. The floorboards are coming up. There's condensation because it was the Long Island Ducks hockey game. That was their main team that played there. It was condensation on the court. The, 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 the brims were not at regulation height. There were a whole host of issues. And George Mikan, who, of course, a well-known NBA player and was the commissioner of the ABA at the time, basically awarded a forfeit in the favor of the Colonels to nothing. So the next season, that first season in Teaneck, didn't even end with them playing in Teaneck. And they had a forfeit of playing game for their first chance to go to the playoffs. It's just, like I said, it's not, I'm not a fiction writer, but it, it's stranger than fiction. It's just really crazy stuff. Now, for the viewers, I want to just show you this. I'm wearing proudly wearing this as I go back as a fan to that year in the New Jersey Americas. I'm wearing my New Jersey Americans t-shirt. You can actually see this is the logo that they had for that one year in New Jersey. Now, you mentioned ABA. You can't talk about the Nets without talking about the ABA, otherwise known as the American Basketball Association, which lasted for nine years from 1967 to 1976. What can you say about what the American Basketball Association was? And it's funny because I leaned heavily on Scott Tarter, who he, so he is the CEO of the Dropping Dimes Foundation. There's been a lot of publicity about how former ABA players and coaches have not been basically taken care of by the NBA. He's trying to fight for those former players that don't get medical benefits, no pension, no recognition really from the current league or the current executives about what they did for the game of basketball. So when comparing, it's funny because you compare those early years, the ABA, the late, that nine year stretch you mentioned, late sixties into the seventies, there's a lot of similarities between how the game was played back then to the current game in the NBA now that, you know, is a three point centric league that there was a lot of open offense. You know, the difference between really at the time, the ABA and the NBA was the NBA was primarily white owned. 
there were the, it was a slower, more conservative style of play. They would walk the ball up the court. It would be dump the ball into, into Bill Russell, dump the ball into Wilt Chamberlain and try to make the extra pass. Whereas the ABA was up tempo. It was fast place, fast pace, I should say. The NBA was really more conservative, not only just in the playing style, but you didn't have the afros and the bell bottom uh, jeans and all the, the pizzazz that a lot of the ABA players had because they wanted that clean cut look that was going to be digestible for mass audiences and good for advertisers. So the ABA just had a lot more flair and they had a lot more, the players were a lot more athletic and had freedom of movement, freedom of playing. And Larry Brown, who talked to me at length about, I mean, you know, it, it took me one email to tell him that I'm writing about chapters of the Nets and the ABA for him to respond immediately. I'm in because he just to the current day said there's such a strong bond between former ABA players, coaches, GMs, owners uh, that they they waxed poetic about that league, that it was such a sad thing that curtain call, of course, with the Nets. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but with them winning that second ABA championship and the ABA's curtain call, it, it was just such a bittersweet ending because I think Larry Brown and everyone, all his counterparts, just loved everything about that league. And, and again, I think there was a lot more defense played at the time in the ABA, and you could probably speak to that, David, than the modern day NBA. But I, I do, in all my interviews and just from the film I've watched and there are a lot of comparisons I see to the modern day NBA with, with the old ABA. There's a book that a lot of people refer to called Loose Balls by Terry Pluto, which a lot of people look at as definitive history of the American Basketball Association. A lot of stories about the Nets. Larry Brown is quoted in that book as well, too. Was that a source for you in writing your history of the Nets? Yeah, it's interesting because the, there's an excerpt from that Loose Balls where the Nets basically had a chance to draft Lou Alcindor, who of course was later known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And, you know, as sometimes these things happen before you have uh, oversight committees, it came down to who's going to offer the bigger check, the Milwaukee Bucks or the, the New York Nets at the time. And basically George Mikan had a check that he knew in his pocket that would have made Lou Alcindor a net, probably would have changed the trajectory of the ABA. And he decided that, you know what, at the next, you know, let's keep this, in my pocket, wait for our next meeting. Well, Lou Alcindor, the, the Bucks offered him a, a, a richer deal. He went off to the NBA and we know what happened with him winning with the Bucks, one championship five with the Lakers. So uh, I referenced that within the book because it just shows that some of the, some of the things that the ABA did, they made a slew of bad business decisions. They didn't even copyright, which was their signature, the red, white, and blue ball, which was so unique. They didn't even copyright that. Um, George Mikan botched the Lou Alcindor situation. So he was basically, without saying it, he was ousted. They said that he left to go back to his law firm and resume that. But the, the general belief was that the ABA owners were so outraged and upset about how everything went down that they basically pushed him out. Um, so when you look at, you know, how the NBA, the ABA started and then eventually folded nine years later, there were a slew of bad business decisions. And, you know, look, they didn't have the television contracts, the media presence, the, the radio partners, television partners to really broadcast to mass mass audiences. So it was really a regionalized situation. And, you know, I, I think they realized they they grew to as big as they could get until they eventually were cannibalized and, and merged with the with the NBA. So your book beautifully chunks out the history into various chapters, into various eras. So before we get into the championship years of the Nets in the mid 70s, can you talk a little bit about the Nets' second year where they moved to Long Island and then become the New York Nets leading up to pre-Dr. J? And it's funny because I mentioned, so they, they're on to their second arena, their second year. They go from Teaneck Armory to all of a sudden they play the play-in game at Comac Arena, where, as I mentioned, they have to forfeit that play-in game because the court's in unplayable condition. There's a whole slew of issues. And for some reason... Arthur Brown and his designees decided, well, that's where I want to make my home is let's go to Comac Arena, which, which I talked to Herb Turetsky, I talked to Larry Brown. Nobody could seem to put that to get together other than um, Whitey Carlson, I guess, had owned a lot of the venues that Arthur Brown had decided to put his team at. So there was some kind of business relationship or relationship there where he was, you know, choosing that and putting that as a precedent over other venues. So in any, in any essence, that was really a hockey arena Larry Brown tells an interesting story about how 
that was the Long Island Ducks that would play there. There was always condensation on the court. And, you know, nowadays it's not unusual to have a hockey team and a basketball team share the same arena. Of course, they didn't have the kind of manpower to be able to, to make sure things were changed over in a, in a tidy, timely fashion. So Rick Barry that year who ultimately played with the Nets in their first ABA finals appearance in 1972. He actually tore his ACL because they had cardboard slabs that were along the sidelines covering the hockey boards where right now, like today you would have the, the baseline seats and the courtside seats. There was nothing preventing any player from that ran out of bounds or spilled into the out of bounds area from getting hurt. And that's how Rick Barry injured his knee. And, and it was a, really a, a bad injury that he ended up missing the Oakland Oaks. I know went to the ABA championship and he, you know, missed a lot of that year. So it was a really wacky, crazy situation for the, for the Nets and, and for the New York Nets at that time. And it was less than ideal, but I think Arthur Brown, he was so desperate. And it's, it's like, it's so funny because the more things change, the more they stay the same. He was so desperate to get New York onto the jerseys that he just basically jumped at the first opportunity, the first venue that said, yes, he was in. And it's funny because now I know one of your questions, David, is why did they move from New Jersey to New York? It's almost as though like they couldn't wait to get out of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we know, things kind of came full circle and then back to New York. But it's just funny that Arthur Brown, he's really was stuck between a rock and a hard place. I mean, at every turn, the Knicks, upon that merger, they made it so difficult for the Nets. They, they levied all these financial burdens on them. They were forced to sell off Dr. J. They tried to trade Dr. J to the Knicks uh, to offset some of that fee and the Knicks refused and they trade him to the 76ers. And then when the net, when the Nets actually moved their first year, of course, they played um, in Long Island and then they moved back to New Jersey. When they moved back to New Jersey, the Knicks charged them a territorial right free for infringing their rights in New Jersey. So, it, it, you know, Arthur Brown was in a very difficult position. The fact that he had this vision of turning an AAU team that he managed the, a, the New York Freighters into the New Jersey Americans and New York Nets, you have to give him a lot of credit. And one of the things I thought that was brilliant, a lot of people kind of give this a bad rap because they think it's kind of, well, it's, it's maybe a lame nickname, but he used a nickname that was popular in the New York metropolitan area with the Mets and the Jets. And he used a basketball specific term with the Nets and he, and it rhymed with Mets and Jets. And it kind of seemed like every, all the pieces fit. That was really one of the few logical decisions that were made to name the team, the New York Nets at the time. And I thought that was a brilliant uh, vision for him to be able to do that. Uh, because again, for myself, having followed those Mets, Jets, and Nets teams, uh, there is that link, not only just the rhyming, but it's now ingrained in the, in the New York metropolitan area. One figure who was part of those early 70s Nets teams playing out there in Long Island was none other than Lou Karnasaka, one of the legends of New York collegiate and pro sports. Yeah, and they, he, he had a, there was an unusual uh, circumstance where they hired York, York Larice, who was only, I believe, 32 years of age when he was hired. But he came in under the condition that he was only going to coach for one season because Lou, who was just a staple at St. John's, he was going to finish out his contract at, at St. John's and then jump on with the Nets the next season. So it's really kind of an interesting arrangement that you don't see many days, many, you know, many times throughout the course of ABA, NBA history. But as you mentioned, I mean, Karnaseka, of course, at St. John's is, is highly regarded. He was obviously Arthur Brown's top choice. But if the Nets had to wait a year, they were going to wait a year. And I think he was ultimately, along with uh, Rick Barry and some of the other moves that were made, Bill Melchioni, one of the really driving forces for making the Nets from the lapping stock that had to forfeit a home playing game to an eventual team that made three ABA finals and won two of them. Now, the team moves to Island Garden uh, out in West Hempstead. And then in the mid 70s, the team takes a turn for the better. And it all happens when they pick up uh, Dr. J, Julius Irving from the Virginia Squires. How did that happen? And how did the Nets' fortunes change once Julius Irving came to the Nets in the early to mid 70s? There was a, so basically there was a very complicated scenario where Julius Irving essentially was, there was a dispute between the Nets, the Squires and the Atlanta, Atlanta Hawks because Julius Irving essentially had claimed that he would belong to the Hawks and that he was gonna play with the Atlanta Hawks. And Walter Kennedy at the time, who was the commissioner of the NBA said, I'm going to find the Hawks 
believe it was $25,000 for every game that Julius Irving played because he was, he was technically not allowed to play with Atlanta, which is a lot of money at the time if you think about it. And that ultimately forced the Hawks' hand. The Squires, of course, had a relocation, you know, had all sorts of financial issues, and they were ultimately forced to trade Julius Irving to the Nets. And I think based on his arrival, when I talked to Herb Turetsky, as soon as Dr. J walked into a room, into a building, he pulled up with his Avanti Studebaker in a white, a white jumpsuit. I mean, he just had this presence and this aura about him that, you know, he was going to change not only the vibe and trajectory of the team, but just made, made a, had a calming influence on the rest of the locker room. And, you know, he was a player that his style, his pizzazz, it wasn't just on the court, it was off the court. It was an ambassador for the game. And the Nets were truly lucky because they almost, just like Lou Alcindor, they almost lost him uh, in, in, the, in the draft to the NBA. And he ultimately stayed within the ABA ranks and then ultimately traded from the Squires to the Nets. So that was a huge development. Really one of the, that was the coalescing of those events. Lou Carseca, Bill Melchioni, and then of course, Julius Irving. To, and uh, I should mention Rick Barry, you know, prior to that, but then, and then Julius Irving really brought some credibility to the Nets, to that team and to the ABA because Julius Irving was not only the face of the Nets franchise at the time, but he was the poster child of the, of the ABA. I mean, he was doing things above the rim and ath athletically. I mean, he, he ripped down th 33 rebounds, I believe in one game, he was doing things that was absolutely unheard of at the time. And, you know, when the Nets, when they were forced to ultimately trade him to the 76ers, it was just, I know I, you know, I didn't live through it, but through secondhand accounts, it was a very devastating point in the, in the franchise. And basically after that ABA championship, all the financial burdens that the team had to carry, they just had to diffuse that championship team in from the inside out and sell off all their assets. And they had, they traded for uh, Brian Taylor for Nate tiny Archambault because he had a lot of deferred hours so they could put off when they had to pay him. It was just a very difficult situation for any owner, any coach, any player on that team. And again, but, you know, they wanted to go for greener pastures. They wanted to be in the NBA. And that was the hefty price they had to pay. And the Knicks definitely didn't make that journey that much easier, for sure. Did the league help engineer that trade for Dr. J to the Nets from the standpoint of, at that point, the ABA is really starting to have financial troubles around 1973, 74. And the argument was that, they wanted him in New York. They needed that kind of national publicity. What better place to be in New York? Although it was going to be in Long Island, the Nets were in a new arena, the Nassau Coliseum, brand new arena. And the fact that he'd be in New York would give the league higher visibility than playing in Virginia. Was it true that the league helped engineer that trade for him going to the Nets? I think that's exactly right. Without, you know, going as far as saying colluding or, you know, overstepping their boundaries. I think that at the time the ABA knew that, you know, this was, they were kind of on the back nine of the, of the league as far as popularity, as far as the, the audiences dwindling, and they needed that superstar attraction. They thought they had it with Lou Alcindor, and they certainly let that slip by, and they weren't going to let it happen again. So whether that was in the form of, of legally, of course, you know, trying to lobby to the commissioner of the NBA at the time, or you know, taking, taking basically the Atlanta Hawks to court, it became a messy dispute, very, very involved, frankly. And, you know, for the NBA that was at that time a big moneymaker, for them to get levied against them, a $25,000 fine, the Atlanta Hawks for, you know, allowing him to play for the team was almost like the reverse of what happened to the Nets when they joined the NBA. They had The Hawks had no other choice but to, you know, rele let, release him and let him, you know, return to the ABA. So, or with the ABA. So I think that's absolutely right, David. I think that, you know, as much as the ABA had a lot of bad luck, they were the the redheaded stepchild of the basketball leagues that was finally the stars had aligned for no pun intended, but literally for them to have a poster child for the league. And one that you look back now, 50, you know, 56 years later, and he's still one of the highest acclaimed, most recognizable athletes of all time. And he's synonymous with ABA greatness, as well as, you know, of course, winning a, a title with the Sixers in the NBA. When he was with the Nets, he played three seasons. 74 season, his first year, they won the ABA championship. 75, probably could have won, but were upset in the playoffs, even though they had a great regular season. And then 76, the last year of the ABA, again, they win the championship. 
John Williamson has an incredible game in the deciding game where they beat the Denver Nuggets for the ABA championship. But Dr. J, one of the greatest performances in any kind of finals, a, a B or NBA in 76, he just single-handedly took over that series against a great Denver Nuggets team with Bobby Jones, David Thompson. It was an unbelievable performance. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say – in 1974, the Celtics, and 1976, the Celtics were NBA champions. And I would contend that the New York Nets with Dr. J, I'm not going to guarantee it, but could have potentially beaten those 74 and 76 Celtic championship teams with Dave Cowens and JoJo White and those players. Any thoughts about that? It's interesting because you look and the Nets, I think I have the record right, but I believe they were 13 and five in ABA NBA exhibition games where they would play against NBA counterparts before the start of the year. And absolutely. I mean, the, the way the ABA was structured, it was the NBA was just such a slow conservative style of play. I don't know that they'd be able to adjust to a player of the caliber and of the, the acrobatic nature of Dr. J. I mean, you talked about that 1976 season, Super John Williamson, of course, carrying them in that decisive game six that they trailed and were down by 13 points in that second half. He had a monstrous 23 point, I think, uh, second half. And the Nets actually that season had lost in the Nichols Sports Arena, you know, in Denver. They had lost every game they played uh, against the Nuggets in the regular season. And that was kind of their house of horrors throughout the year, except for game one, where Julius Irving hit a game winning baseline jumper to give them a 1-0 lead. And then, of course, the heroics in game six, the swan song of the ABA uh, with basically them dribbling out the clock and celebrating. And it, it's funny, I guess it's not all that unexpected, but it's funny that it was not met with that much fanfare, excitement. You know, the, the Knicks, of course, with their two championships uh, in 1970 and 1973, where uh, basically ticker tape parades, Canyon of Heroes, you know, thousands upon tens of thousands of people. And when I talked to Brian Taylor about what was the reception like for fans and, you know, in the aftermath of the 74 season and 1276, and, you know, he said it was, it was nice that, you know, they got the key to the city from the mayor and there was a, a small reception at Nassau Coliseum but nothing like you would see, as you mentioned, with those Celtics teams of the Knicks and the NBA. So, you know, that's one of the, I guess, uh, you know, maybe the sadder, bittersweet parts of the end of the ABA and those two championships that the Nets won because they really didn't get the credit that they deserved, that they were every bit as good as the top echelon teams in the NBA at that time. And the numbers bear that out. When you look at, you know, again, I'd, I'd like to go back and look at the ABA overall against the NBA and exhibition games, but certainly the Nets held their own. And in fact, they didn't even hold their own. They were able to fairly easily dominate most of the teams in the NBA with Julius Irving as the, the face of the franchise. Now, chapter three, moving on with their history now, now we're in the mid seventies. Chapter three is collateral damage of the post ABA NBA merger, 1976, 77 through 1980, 81. This is the transition for the franchise remaining in New York for one season and then moving back to New Jersey the season after. Can you talk about that time period? And again, I teased this a little bit from the start, but you know, though there were the four, there was the the four teams that are absorbed into the ABA of course into the NBA from the ABA. It was a difficult situation for the Nets. They were, you know, rocking a hard place. They had to sell off a lot of their high priced players. And there was not much expectation for the team heading into that year. Of course, they played one year at Nassau Coliseum that final year there and then transitioning to eventually at the Rutgers Athletic Center and becoming the New Jersey Nets. But that first year in the NBA it was really a wake up call uh, for, you know, Kevin Lowry, who was the coach, of course, for those two ABA championship teams. I mean, he went from the top of the ABA mountain where the Nets were were idolized and they had one of the top players in both leagues to now the bottom rung in an NBA hierarchy that, as we alluded to, had the Knicks and Celtics teams of those 70s. And it was not an unexpected fall from grace for the Nets. And it was just thought of basically as a, a reboot. They were going to have refresh. They were going to have a, a new facelift, a new arena to play in, a new state for this nomadic franchise that now is wandering across straight uh, state lines from New Jersey to New York and now back to New Jersey in what, less than a, in a nine-year period. So 
you know, the, the results were not all that pretty on the court that, that the Nassau Coliseum that would hold 13 to 15,000 fans, even Brian Taylor, he joined, he watched the team in their 1972 ABA finals when they appeared in the finals and they ultimately lost to the Indiana Pacers. He went to a lot of Nets games during that playoff run with Rick Barry. And he was just in awe of how that arena had embraced the team that they loved, even though Rick Barry wasn't always the warmest of fans and, you know, was a, a difficult person to deal with. They loved that team. And then, you know, to see, and he wasn't with them, he was traded, but to see how far they had fallen that market and that arena to now being just basically filled with opposing fans or just basketball diehards, you know, was a difficult pill to swallow. And quite frankly, until the arrival of Larry Brown in the early 80s, when he really started changing the culture and trajectory of the team, you saw the Nets in, in pretty much a rut for the late 70s up until Larry Brown's arrival in the early 80s. One of those players during that time frame, he was a player, and I believe he was a player and assistant coach, was a player of the name of Phil Jackson. Can you talk about that? And Phil Jackson, again, I mean, he was even on that second the second championship the Knicks won, he had, I believe he was out for the year. He got his championship ring, but he had an injured back and, you know, he didn't play of course in, in that playoff year. But um, when they made the trade for Phil Jackson, you know, I looked at it as though he was just a guy that was, and it's funny because you watch, I watched the last dance documentary and you find out about his upbringing and how it was kind of, you know, the loosey goosey seventies and, frankly, you know, how he had been a little wild with drugs and womanizing and all those kinds of things. And, and that different outlook that he had on life kind of almost seemed like a calming and he had a veteran presence at that time, but he's 31, 32 years old. So it was a team that was filled with a lot of unproven, inexperienced young players. And I think even though, as far as a player, you mentioned more like a player coach mentor, he had a calming influence on that team. And again, it's, it, the results weren't pretty, but I think that ultimately a guy like Phil Jackson, of course, maybe they should have held on to him as head coach. They, they should definitely have held on to him as head coach. Um, certainly that's a blip on the radar and it's something that's kind of a fun little tidbit in Nets history that he was kind of, that was a pit stop in his long, more coaching career than playing career. But, you know, they, they also had Rick Carlisle going back, you know, number of years flash forward into the future. They had him as they signed him that ultimately became a player coach. So it's funny seeing all these uh, Nets that ultimately were in within the staff, whether it's on the roster or on the coaching staff, that they let it get away. And it's almost as a modern day fan, like, you know, how did they, if they saw that much in these people, why, why would they let them get out the building? Now, you talked about them playing in all these different places, being kind of a vagabond franchise. Well, there's finally light at the end of the tunnel in 1981, when they really get their first true basketball arena to play, when they move into the brand spanking new, at that time called Brendan Byrne Arena in East Rutherford, New Jersey. And the book talks about rise to respectability, 1981 to 1982 through 1985 to 1986. And I'll talk a little bit about that because I saw a lot of games of those teams. And the Nets, although the league was very top heavy, you had the Sixers, you had the Celtics and the Lakers pretty much dominated the entire decade. And there was everybody, and maybe the Bucks to a lesser degree, and then, of course, the Pistons at the end of the decade, but those three pretty much dominated the NBA through that decade, so there was really no chance for the Nets to be contending for an NBA championship, but they had very good teams during that era uh, with Mike Jaminski, Michael Korn, Albert King, Michael Ray Richardson, Otis Birdsong, uh, and they were contending teams. They made the playoffs every year, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, I think only about five or so franchises in the entire NBA made the postseason those five years, the Nets being one of them, which is pretty impressive. So as you say in the chapter, the team really did, did get NBA respectability at that time. And you just go back a few years prior to that. They're playing at a glorified college gym. It's funny, Herb Turetsky, the, the scorekeeper, had told me that was his phrase, that away to Piscataway. Nobody even knew where that was. He even said... It's in the middle of the boondocks that, why, you know, why all of a sudden just how you talked about it's a vagabond franchise, nomadic, looking for that next arena, looking for that uh, brighter, shinier facility. Well, they didn't find that in Piscataway. They found a basically small college town, a uh, subpar facility. I mean, it was the worst facility in the entire NBA at the time. 
And the team, the as you mentioned, up until those early mid eighties, it wasn't making the playoffs at the Rutgers Athletic Center. And upon that move to the to the Meadowlands, which of course Sonny Werblin had a vision for what ultimately became the Meadowlands Sports Complex, uh, involving Giant Stadium, the racetrack, and I mean we've seen how much that's developed to the modern day. But of course that Brendan Byrne Arena being part of that, it just legitimized this franchise. And you know really the wheels that got that in motion were when the team was bought by a syndicate, which was the Secaucus Seven. There was a lot of dysfunction because there were seven seven different cooks in the kitchen, seven mm-hmm. different owners, and that, that led to a lot of issues down the road. But as far as finally stabilizing the financial side of the franchise, that had a lasting impact that allowed the team to stay there for many, many years until, of course, as we know, that transition interim moved to Newark and then ultimately to Brooklyn. So that that early 80s time period, the, the purchase of the team by the Secaucus 7, the arrival of Larry Brown, and, you know, we talk about those early, that early year with Larry Brown. I mean, they, to this day, the Nets, when they were 50 and 32 uh, with Jason Kidd as that as the head player in 2002, right, the first of their two mm-hmm. legs of the finals appearances, they, uh, sorry, 52 and 30, they, that was the best record they had in the NBA. The second best record was 49 and 33 to that point. They've since tied that, but 49 to 33 was Larry Brown and, you know, his first year with the franchise. So it was an immediate impact that he had right away. And, you know, drafting Buck Williams, it was all these, these factors that came together similar to, uh, you know, not in any way comparing Buck Williams and Dr. J, but it seemed like from ownership from the front office and then down to the coaching staff and making the right personnel decisions. Everything was coming together for that 80s uh, run that you alluded to. But unfortunately for Larry Brown, he was always um, flirting with the next girl at the dance, as they say, because he would had one foot in the door, one foot out the other. And that really uh, that really rubbed uh, the owner the wrong way, Joseph Taub, who was, of course, the, the principal and most uh, hands on owner of the of the seven owners. And he basically fired him on a team plane at the tarmac, didn't let him coach uh, the final couple games of the season and coach, you know, in the playoffs. And, you know, the Nets really tried to, to hold on. And they, as you mentioned, they had some nice, they, they built a, such a collection of talent. They had some nice playoff runs, but you really wonder how things could have evolved and come together. Had Larry Brown just kind of kept his eyes off, you know, other teams, how that culture and how that team would have been built with him at the helm. No, you know, no slight to Stan Allback because I think he was a good coach in his own right. But, you know, Larry Brown has proven his track record of 40 plus years as coaching every program he takes over. He's not there long, but he turns them into a contender almost right away. Now, despite having those good teams in the early 80s and early 90s, they had some good teams. Derek Coleman, Drazen Petrovic, that year as well, too. Their first 25 seasons in the NBA sadly result in only one playoff series win and it was a quite of a bizarre playoff series win they won in 1984 defeating the defending nba champion 76ers with julius irving in five games in the first round and what was incredible about that series was that the road team won every game which was just absolutely amazing that that happened but unfortunately the nets were never able to uh, extend that postseason success the future years they make the postseason until the 2001-2002 season and in one of the great trades in that history. And again, history has changed in the way that Dr. J turned the Nets into a respectable championship franchise in the ABA. Jason Kidd comes from the Phoenix Suns to the New Jersey Nets in 2001-2002. Can you talk about just how transformative him coming to the franchise was during that time frame, and what was the end result of him coming to New Jersey? Yeah, it's remarkable, like you mentioned, that that playoff series win drought going from the mid-80s to 2001, 2002. When you just think about that, of all the teams, those early 90s teams and all the talent they had, never able to get over that hump. And of course, you know, you had the New York Knicks of the 90s era and the Chicago Bulls and the Indiana Pacers. It were always a roadblock to the Nets to try to get into a second round or dare I say an Easter conference finals. So when Jason Kidd, the trade went down for Jason Kidd and Michael Rowe, who he actually served before he was the president of the Nets in 1995, he had served as the president of the New Jersey Sports and Exposition Authority. So he had managed that whole 
operation at the Meadowlands and he came over to the net. So he brought a very savvy business sense and ability to market the franchise and a difficult situation, of course, which we can talk about how they ultimately moved away from the Meadowlands without mass transit. You know, there were a lot of, even during Jason Kidd's era with the team, there were some playoff games that were not fully sold out. But nonetheless, when Jason Kidd came over, Michael Rowe talks about, because he, his tenure went right up to before Jason Kidd uh, was, tr was uh, traded for and, and came to the Nets. But he claims that because the Nets had built such team-friendly contracts, they got no, not only team-friendly contracts, but good guys on the court, off the court. They built a culture, and they ultimately compiled enough assets to be able to entice a team like the Phoenix Suns to, to take a Stephon Marbury, who was an outstanding player. I think he's one of the more underrated players in the history of the Nets franchise. Always got a really bad rap, I thought, that they said he was a selfish player. Never gave him enough time, I thought, to really develop and put enough pieces around him. But nonetheless, the Nets had an opportunity. Rod Thorne at the time, who was the new general manager, saw what he could get in Jason Kidd. And as Michael Rose said, he basically said, can I drive him to the airport? Like, I, you know, where do I sign? So when Jason Kidd came over, I think that he played, and Lawrence Frank says this in the book, he played with such a fervor and anger that a player of his caliber would just be kind of cast aside and traded like that from Phoenix because he had basically some off the court issues with his then wife at the time, domestic violence dispute and such. And he, from day one, when he arrived with the Nets, was diving on loose balls during training camp. He wasn't, uh, you know, the kind of player or leader that was going to be rah, rah and say much and give these fiery speeches. He was going to lead by example. So when your best player who he, absolutely without a doubt shadow of a doubt was at the time is diving on loose balls in training camp that's going to trickle down to the rest of the roster so there was no doubt in Lawrence Frank's mind there was no doubt in Rod Thorne or Michael Rowe who of course now watch from afar that Jason Kidd was the real deal how everything came together and that team that was really like the Cinderella team the little engine that could made its way through an entire Eastern Conference with really you know I know that Kenya Martin eventually evolved into an all-star Richard Jefferson, for as long as he was a net, was never named to an all-star, which is so astonishing to me. Uh, and then, of course, they trade for Vince Carter down the road. But nonetheless, that was not a team that was littered with all the all-star caliber of talent. It was a team that just had this undeniable will. And that, that started and ended with Jason Kidd. And he really just propelled this franchise to new heights. And in such a different way than Dr. J, he wasn't playing above the rim. He wasn't wowing with these acrobatic dunks. And, you know, blazing up and down the court, he was a cerebral player. He, of course, had speed in the open court, but he, you know, his mission was to get everybody involved and he raised the level of all the players around him. And, and, you know, to this day, I think he's one of the handful of players that I've watched that, you know, you just marvel at because he really made the most, his physical tools are great, but he made the most of, of the IQ side and the, and the cerebral side of the game. Now, before we get to Brooklyn, just a few more things about New Jersey. One was, at one point, there was talk about changing the name to Swamp Dragons. Thankfully, that didn't happen. What's the story about that? I touch on that in the book. So basically, how it came about was the former, so who, the predecessor to Michael Rowe was a guy by the name of John Spolstra. He was a very creative marketer. He was actually known for, he sent, when the Nets were struggling for season tickets, he sent to season ticket holders that didn't renew their tickets yet for the upcoming season. He sent out rubber chickens that with the with sign on them that says, don't foul out F O W L like a foul for a chicken. And, and he was known as doing these quirky things. He at one time wanted to change the city of East Rutherford to convince them to change the name to Nike uh, so that they could sell that as a branding opportunity to Nike. He was looking and grasping at every straw to try to try to make any dollar that was out there for, you know, a franchise that would, struggling financially so when you know he he got in a room with a lot of creative marketing types and they you know looked at where is the team situated they're playing in the swamp this could be a swamp dragon situation they came up at the time the raptors were a expansion team joining the league with the grizzlies and there was a lot there was a lot of positivity surrounding that branding with a cartoon dinosaur and the nets kind of used that as a template to say we could do some kind of swamp monster swamp dragon well as it turned out they were going to have a board meeting to vote on this and basically they got a lot of pushback i won't i won't use the exact words that i heard from secondhand accounts of david stern but he was not very happy with the idea of changing the team to the new jersey swamp dragon he thought it was the dumbest idea he could ever think of and christy whitman didn't like it either uh so basically that that idea kind of died on the vine but the craziest thing of all is that the other nba teams had a vote 
to approve the name change, every team voted for the name change except for the Nets. That because of the outside pressure they faced from, you know, the league being David Commissioner and from some of the local officials about the name change and because they had seven owners, actually eight because this eighth was silent, said they couldn't agree on something. So they were that close to becoming the New Jersey Swamp Dragons, but they just, which was a, a prevalent theme along with the team being nomadic, they couldn't get on the same page, which I think in the end of the day is probably a good thing for the franchise. I think that would have been cute for a couple of years, but it wouldn't go so well if they were the Brooklyn Swamp Dragons. So. Now this interview is being conducted with the North Bergen Public Library and North Bergen actually has a connection with the Nets franchise. Can you talk about that? When John Calipari arrives with the Nets, that would have been 96 since the 97 season, Bobby Marks, who is a, a ESPN uh, analyst right now, and he was, of course, spent many years um, rising from, you know, I won't say low level, but I'll say almost as an intern with the Nets to assistant GM over the years. You know, his, his first season coincided with Calipari being there. He talks about how substandard the Nets facilities were at the time. They played, they practice at an ADP trucking facility where basically the Nets players and coaches were getting changed in a locker room where with cross country truck drivers. And when Calipari got wind of this, there was no way that was going to fly. So he tried a number of different things. They ultimately, after that 97, 98 season, they moved to Murray Hill Parkway and they have, of course, what was a beautiful facility, I thought, in the, you know, outside of the Meadowlands in East Rutherford. But before that, they practiced both at uh, the Teaneck campus of Fairleigh Dickinson, my alma mater, um, and they practiced there, but there were some issues with scheduling, you know, the Nets, which is the craziest thing to think about. They had to fit their schedule in with, you know, the women's volleyball team or the men's basketball team that was playing at Teaneck at FDU. And it wasn't ideal because their, their practice times were changing day by day. So then they moved to Ramapo, which of course is, you know, Bergen County uh, area, because that was Calipari. That was Cal Powery's area. He like he was in Saddle River. A lot of the players, Kerry Kittles at the time, Keith Van Horn lived up in that area. So they had a lot of ties and they had a lot of practice time at Ramapo and the Teaneck Armory. And one of the interesting stories that uh, Bobby Marks talks about is the Kobe Bryant, the year that Kobe Bryant was teed up to be drafted by the Nets. You know, he, he basically made what amounted, his agent made what amounted to an idle threat that he would, if the Nets drafted him, he would go over and play in Italy, which we find out after the fact that was not really true. He just didn't at the time want to come to the Nets, he would have played with them. But that those workouts, when the Nets did pre-draft workouts with Kobe Bryant, those all took place at Fairleigh Dick Dickinson T-Neck. So there are a lot of ties. And I know, you know, even going back probably 15 years now, the Nets would always have a open practice at T-Neck uh, FDU because they knew they had strong roots and ties to that area. So that's kind of another little known fact in the Nets nomadic history. Now we'll move on to their next step for the franchise there with Jason Kidd from 2001 to the middle part of the latter part of that decade, 2001, 2002, the 2003, the 2004, 2006 teams, four out of five years, division championships, two NBA finals, uh, just an incredible run. They were dominant in the 2003 postseason, unfortunately fall short in six games to San Antonio, but just an incredible run. The Nets are a legitimate power franchise in the first decade of the 2000s. And then all of a sudden an announcement comes about Brooklyn. Take us through that in terms of the decision to move to Brooklyn. It took a while from when they made the decision, they physically moved there and there were a lot of politics involved with it, but the announcement was made at a certain point, but they didn't move till years later. Can you take us through the move to Brooklyn? Yeah, and so it dates back, Michael Rowe brought me through a lot of these mid-90s where this started to formulate was that the Secaucus 8 at the time sold the team to a group led by Ray Chambers. And Ray Chambers, of course, who was you know very much involved with the Devils, he ultimately wanted to move the Nets to Newark to be part of a renaissance of Newark, which was his hometown. And ultimately, there was a lot of pushback from Governor Christy Whitman, again, because the Devils at the time wanted to move to Hoboken. So the governor was saying it was very difficult to come up with a two arena solution to sell to really, frankly, taxpayers into the state. So they had to find a way to find a one arena solution. They couldn't seem to do that for whatever reason that the Nets, Michael Rowe walked me through a number of different meetings they had. They had a signed deal, a handshake agreement 
They were going to move back to Long Island. They're going to go back to Nassau Coliseum and Charles Wong. They had a meeting with Charles Wong where they were basically going to move back there. And one of the owners said, nope, we didn't buy the team to move it from New Jersey. I bought, I want the team staying in New Jersey, but we're not going to move there. Then they had at least a half a dozen meetings with uh, Mark Chekets, who was, uh, you know, the head of Madison Square Garden at the time, about having the Nets and Knicks share an arena and play it at Madison Square Garden. It became too difficult between concerts, different events, Nets and Knicks home games, sharing a home locker room. It, it they tried to find every which way about it to try to make it work. It didn't work. So at the end of the day, it's funny because Ray Chambers, who was involved with the Nets and the Devils, he wanted his hockey, he wanted his hockey team and his, and his basketball team to be in Newark. And they were for two years, but that was a pit stop on the way to Brooklyn. And ultimately, instead of selling the team to Charles Wong, who was going to move them to Long Island, they sold the team to Bruce Ratner, who moved them out of New Jersey anyway. And the, the main reason, and one of the things that came out in this book is that when the Knicks were, were up for sale for ITT company, they basically needed the approval of all 30 NBA teams, of themselves, of course, 29 other NBA teams. So essentially they needed, David Stern called Michael Rowe at the time and said, the Knicks need a favor. What are you gonna ask them for? And Michael Rowe was kind of puzzled at the time and said, I'm not sure. And David Cern said, you're going to ask them to allow you to move outside of the New Jersey area, to allow you to move anywhere within New York, because that was part of the stipulation when the Nets, of course, were merged with the ABA, when they moved to back to New Jersey, was the Knicks wanted to take a stranglehold on New York. So while, while the Knicks made that concession, and because of their pending sale, that is the only reason that now you find the Nets playing in Brooklyn was because if that one phone call from David Stern to Michael Rowe paved the way for the Nets to land in the borough. And it was such a circuitous winding road that they finally found themselves there. And it was a pit stop in Newark. And it was, as you mentioned, David, I would say eight years in the making, it was almost like 10 or 12 years in the making. And it could have fell through about 10 or 20 different times. I do want to get to, we have a question here and I do want to get to that to ask that question. Did the Nets have a national TV audience during the NBA Finals? I remember reading the NBA Finals were on tape delay in the 80s is a question from, uh, and he's talking about the ABA Finals in 74 and 76. Yeah, I mean, they were, so there were no local television contracts at the time. So, you know, the Nets didn't necessarily, leading up to those ABA Finals years, have play-by-play -play announcers at all times, whether it be radio or television. But yes, that they were broadcasted well. Again, you know, that was really, as David alluded to, one of the reasons the ABA pushed so hard for Dr. J uh, to come to stay with them, to stay within that league and to ultimately be traded from the Squires to the Nets was because the Nets in New York were in a top media market. And that was really the ABA was trying to hang their hat on the fact that they could draw in a national television audience and bring in that big national television revenue with a marketable star like Julius Irving. Now, the Nets have been in Brooklyn, and this will be my final question here before we wrap up, have been in Brooklyn now for a decade, yet they've only won two playoff series during that decade. What's your take as far as a summation of that first decade and where you see them going their second decade in Brooklyn? I've seen a lot going, and I know we have uh, a few minutes here, but I... I've seen a lot of hasty ownership. I've seen Mikhail Prokhorov making a, upon his purchase of the team, you know, of course, staying through that interim move to Newark and then gearing up for Brooklyn, making a championship guarantee, trying to win at all costs, selling off all their young assets, unprotected draft picks to try to win now. And that strategy backfiring. And they tried to go from a team that, you know, that's the chapter of their final chapter in New Jersey, playing out the string. They didn't make, of course, the playoffs in those final few seasons in New Jersey, and they tried to, at a drop of a hat upon the arrival in Brooklyn, of course, they trade for Darren Williams at the all-star break right before their final season in New Jersey. They try to put high play price players around him. They bring in Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce and Jason Terry. That backfires. So ultimately, I see the, the ownership that was Mikhail Prokhorov was very hasty. I think he, frankly, didn't have the Nets' best interest in mind. He was, uh, you know, he had some, let's just call it devious business practices, how he got his money over to the United States. 
he, he took what was a failing asset, he turned it into a billion dollar brand and he sold it to Joseph Tsai, who now is the current owner and owns and operates the arena. And, you know, you even see reports that the Nets were hemorrhaging and losing a lot of money now in Brooklyn because it's been such a, it's almost been history repeating itself, been a rotating carousel of coaches and GMs and players. And uh, they really have failed to establish a culture. And I really felt that over the last year or two, when they had Kyrie Irving and, and Kevin Durant sign on with this team, that that was going to be them starting to build something. And some of that has started to fall apart. So uh, the long and short of it is from what I've researched and you, I know you've lived through basically all of this Nets history, David, and I've read through and, and gone through secondhand accounts. I wouldn't rule out the fact that Nets could rule, could move back to Long Island, back to New Jersey. I don't know if you were to ask me in five or 10 years where this franchise will be. I can't give you a definitive answer because I think so much is in flux and it's funny, like, like I said at the start, as much as things change, they kind of say the same, that this was supposed to be the dawn of a new era of Nets basketball. And, you know, it, it looks more like it could fall apart than it could come together at this point in time. Well, everyone, the book is a history of the Nets from Teaneck to Brooklyn. I will say this book is incredibly well researched, lots of depth in terms of the coverage of the Nets from the beginning all the way up to the present day. Uh, Rick, outstanding job with the book. Thank you so much for taking the time for doing this interview with us. We really appreciate it. And best wishes with the book. Thank you again. And thank Chelsea you. Neary and the North Bergen Public Library, thank you as well. Thank you very thank much. You. Pleasure is all mine. You know that we do have a copy of the book here at the library. So if you do want to check out the book and read it, we do have it. Um, we do have, I do want to invite the audience at this time, if you have any questions, now's the time to put it in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, we do have a couple questions already waiting. Um, was John Sterling interviewed for the book? Seems like he started his nicknames back then with Bernard Sky, B.B. King, an example. Yeah, it's funny because, I, you know, when I talked about the Nets really not embracing their history, and I'll be full disclosure, I did not get much cooperation from the Nets public relations team and trying to uncover a lot of alumni. So a lot of that was up to myself. And I had some resources that actually used to work with the Nets during the Jason Kidd era. And, you know, we connected a lot of dots, tried to bring in as many alumni for interviews and tried to leave no stone unturned, whether it was Jason Kidd trying to interview uh, Richard Jefferson. Unfortunately, John Sterling was not among the interviews that I got, but you know, I was able to get Tim Capstraw, of course, who came on with the Nets in 2003. So I got the broadcasting perspective, but, um, but no, John Sterling, again, if there's another project, Yankees or, or Mets, he will definitely be on my target list for sure. Awesome. Um, and one last question, just coming from me. Um, what is your favorite story about the New York Nets that you found out while researching your book? it's kind of a sad story, but it, it's laughable because the, the year that they went 12 and 70, which was their last year at Continental Airlines Arena, then I, Izod Center, uh, the Bobby Marks tells a story about how the team was just in such a downtrodden state, couldn't win a game, were just, they were on pace to break the worst record for, in the history of the NBA. And they brought a voodoo expert in that basically took pins and needles and were putting them into a doll and into the body to try to show if he's not in pain, that they shouldn't be in pain and that thing, there were brighter days ahead and not to get too down on yourself. And, you know, Bobby, who's trying to keep a straight face in, in this kind of presentation is saying what he's almost rethinking his career choice. Why did I even get involved in this? So it's such a, a bizarre, but funny story. And it shows how far the Nets had fallen and how they got back up, of course, uh, upon the move to Brooklyn. Perfect, thank you. And I think that was all the questions that we had in the chat. So I wanna say a big thank you to the audience for coming out tonight and joining us for this presentation. Rick, I wanna say a big thank you to you for coming out and volunteering your time to give this presentation to us. It was absolutely wonderful. And David, I wanna say a big thank you to you as well for coming and conducting this interview. It was very educational and interesting from both of you. And we had a fantastic time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.